we'll get started and if we can rise. Mr. Oliver. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to gather today uh, as a board and a faculty and staff here at St. Pete College and to learn and understand and make decisions uh, in the, uh, uh, for the, the, uh, the students here. We thank you for this day and as, as always, uh, we pray in your name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one more nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First, Mr. President. Uh, Resolutions? Yes, Mr. Let me just, uh, for those who don't know, Mr. Gibbons is going to phone in. He has a conflict today and he wants to participate at the early part of the meeting, so, so we'll do that. Let me ask uh, Jim Parker to come forward, please. And his friends and supporters. Good to have you here this morning. <clears throat> Whereas James Parker began his career as counselor on the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus of St. Petersburg College in 1992, and whereas Mr. Parker immediately initiated career exploration workshops, which included career assessments, interpretation, and career assessment inventories, and students' research of viable career choices. And whereas Mr. Parker led SOAR, a student success initiative which addressed strategies for efficient and effective time management, the art of note taking, how to stay calm and reduce test anxieties, and other strategies designed to enhance students' academic success. And whereas Mr. Parker also served as advisor to the Harambee Black Student Union for 13 years. And whereas Mr. Parker transferred to the Clearwater campus in November 2005 and upon his arrival reactivated Bedea, the Black Student Union, which had been on hiatus. And whereas Mr. Parker is a charter member of the Johnny Ruth Clark chapter of the National Council of Black American Affairs and affiliate council of the American Association of Community Colleges. And whereas Mr. Parker is an excellent motivational speaker is an excellent motivational speaker and has facilitated many workshops which have included topics relative to the economic benefits of higher education and how to sustain a viable black student union during the austere financial times. Now therefore be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college and to the community by James Parker and extend to him our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. This resolution adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees this 21st day of October, 2014. Congratulations. Well, uh, I'd like to say I really want to thank St. Petersburg College for the opportunity to serve our students and the community over the years. Um, I, as a counselor, I had the opportunity to sit with students and spend a lot more time with them and to explore the obstacles and problems that they're having. And as you know, they're having obstacles and problems. But it was my pleasure to get to know a lot of the students personally. Um, again, I uh, just want to thank the college, uh, past administration and present, again for the opportunity. And uh, I worked with wonderful people, and I will certainly miss you all. Thank you again. Thank you. Friends in here, okay? It's not my fault. There you go, thanks. <clears throat> Dr. Evelyn Finkley. Dr. Evelyn Finkley began her highly successful St. Petersburg College career 
teaching composition and literature on the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus in 1990. And whereas Dr. Finkley was named program director of the communications department on the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus in 1998, and later served as program director of the social sciences department and learning support commons as well. And whereas Dr. Finkley over the years supported teaching and learning by creating a supportive and congenial atmosphere in her department for the many faculty members and staff she hired, and whereas Dr. Finkley tirelessly supported Phi Theta Kappa, from which she received National Service Award and has collaborated with faculty and the Student Government Association to bring nationally known speakers to St. Petersburg College, and whereas Dr. Finkley has embraced developmental education reform on the St. Petersburg Gibb campus, as well as online education through her contributions to online course development. We wish her the best as she travels, spends time with family, and continues her many activities in the community. <coughs> now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the total college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college and the community by Dr. Evelyn Finkley and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment through the years ahead. This resolution adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees this 21st day of October. Hear, hear. What a great career. That's wonderful. You get that, okay? But first we get us. Okay. And everybody else step in. Okay, I was coerced into coming today. I was not coming to this because it's an emotional thing for me. St. Petersburg College is an amazing school and the mission is dear to my heart and I, nostalgia, it's really interesting. Nostalgia enters you into uh, an imaginary space and my imaginary space is wonderful. <laughs> Thank you very much and as always I'm a wonderful volunteer and I would be happy to help in any way shape or possible because I am here in the county. Um, I was saying earlier I have a house in Northern Virginia and what I call my West Virginia pod and I'm here. I've just returned from a needlepoint symposium at the National <laughs> Cathedral and um, I have lots and lots of interests but my heart is with this school, and I thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, moving along, recognitions and announcements. Did Do I see Dr. Oh, Williams? Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, I am so excited and with great pride I stand before you today to share with you that St. Petersburg College's College Experience was awarded the Chancellor's Best Practices Award for the State of Florida for the 2014 year. Um, this award recognizes our strategies, activities, or approaches that have been shown through research and evaluation to be most effective for student success. This award truly belongs to the entire college. The leadership of the provost and associate provost, the deans, the um, district team, the AIS team, marketing, advising managers, financial aid, um, the whole team, you name it, that group put the college experience together. So next week, I'll have the opportunity to attend um, the ceremony for receiving this award in Sandestin, Florida. I'm so excited. Um, but I'm more proud of, of the team. And so if I had to say who deserved the award, it is the entire college. Thank you, Dr. Law, for your leadership. Thank you, provost and deans and associate provost, everyone who was involved in us getting this outstanding award. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, on, uh, how does how the selection process takes place? I mean, it's, this is a big deal. The, uh, the, the Chancellor's Office sends out uh, a program announcement. It's now time if you have a practice that you want to recommend. So it's self-nominated. It's a fairly lengthy descriptor. Um, 
there are lots of people with good ideas and lots of things worthy of support. You know, our colleagues do, do great work. Uh, our team, because we've been so focused on one thing, we're pretty good at putting this together now. We, we can describe what we're doing and make sense to outsiders, and the results are speak for themselves. So uh, it goes through a vetting process at the state level, and, um, and then we... We wait for the white smoke. That's <laughs> Congratul <laughs> congratulations. That's uh, quite that accomplishment. That's very nice, Tanja. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Kavanaugh. Thank you, Dr. Law, uh, for allowing me to step up here for just a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you, Board of Trustees, faculty, and staff. Uh, it is my pleasure uh, to make two quick announcements. Uh, first. Uh, our move in veteran services to centralized processing and our uh, uh, processing supervisor that uh, we received uh, as a staff member last year has paid off. Uh, we recently had a federal audit. Uh, we passed the compliance audit with zero discrepancies. That is the first time that's ever happened at St. Pete College. That doesn't mean that we've been poor in the past. It just means we've had some minor discrepancies. But uh, we passed with zero discrepancies. That is a rare occasion and something to be very, very proud of. The other item that I'd like to announce is that uh, uh, it is, is my pleasure to mention that um, it was recently announced by three uh, top military publications, Military Advanced Education, uh, G GI Jobs, and the Military Times uh, that St. Petersburg College uh, has been selected as the top 5% military friendly colleges throughout the United States. And that is a testament to uh, the staff, faculty, the veteran services team, and of course, everyone in this, in this room. So those are my announcements. Thank you very Thank much. You. Congratulations. <laughs> Diana. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and President Dr. Law. Just take a few moments this morning to introduce you to two new members of my team. Uh, Rita Farlow is our new Assistant Director of Strategic Communications. Okay. Uh, Rita comes to us from Pinellas County Schools, she w where she was the Communications Coordinator for the Office of Strategic Communications, and she was a former reporter for the Tampa Bay Times. It's also a privilege to introduce you to our new Manager of Search Engine Marketing, Jamal Hale. Uh, Jamal relocated from Northern Virginia to join us. He's officially Google certified and earned his bachelor's degree from Full Sail University. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Uh, moving down uh, comments, I only had one. It's uh, a compliment. I had a chance to attend a couple different things, even though I've been affiliated with the, the school for four years. And uh, I'm continuing to be amazed at what this college provides this community and all the positive work. I think it's virtually impossible. I'm not sure how you all attend to everything, but I attended a couple luncheons and uh, just uh, was educated on what St. Pete College means to the community. So, thank you. Uh, unbelievable. Other other comments? I'll put Ms. West Nine. I do. Um, I'm going to dovetail on what you just said and how important we are to this community and how somewhat how um, how powerful um, of a message that we send to the community. Um, our as our institute or strategic policy institute has grown, I think that um, we need to come up with some guidelines and what I'm going to call some kind of neutrality guidelines um, to make sure that we are we are informational, but that we are not persuasive. Um, it is this board that <clears throat> makes decisions as to what we will support and what we don't. Um, but I would, we, we do some amazing things. And we, I mean, I went to a judicial debate where I think we had close to 100 folks in the room. Um, but I think at the same time, we need to make sure that we, we have written policies in place that we can follow. And so that, that's my only comment. How do we propose the, the other? <laughs> Let us um, thank you for the input. And, and to credit, uh, Trustee Westing called me with her concern. <laughs> it's a while ago because we didn't have the meeting in September and, and whatnot. Um, let's, let's take it as, as valuable input. Here, here's, here's my response. I'm not sure we want to let the Greenlight Pinellas uh, by play 
determine all of our give and take, okay? I, I think people see that. that. That's been the hardest public policy debate we have had since we did the institutes. The, the feelings run deeper, the emotions are stronger, um, the edges are further apart. Uh, we've done gun control, we've done lots of things, and never once were we accused of being partisan in, in any way, shape, or form. So what I, I'm, I'm happy to, to try to make sure that we have a statement that does that, that we, we vet it. I vetted that and I have to take personal responsibility. I, I did not view us as taking sides either way. So I want to be sure we don't use that as the case. We were accused of everything under the sun. Again, the, Had that been the issue, I'd have brought that uh, okay, up. Okay, because these, the, these are the folks who wanted to see the questions in advance. They wanted to hand us questions to the other side. They wanted to, to determine all of that. My, my only point is we are a, power, we are a powerful institution in this community, and we should be informational, uh, not persuasive. I get it. And That's it. Then let's have a mission statement. Let's make sure that appears everywhere and hold ourselves to that. We, we, that, can, we can make that work. We can make that work. Thank you for your All I was asking okay, for. That's good. This one, we'll be glad when Election Day comes and goes on, on this issue. Okay. okay. Thank you. Ms. Bellow? Comments? Ms. Bellow? Good. Mr. Gibbons, welcome. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> I just told him to mute his phone, so he may be trying to unmute it now. <laughs> okay. Mr. President. Uh, I have a, just a couple of uh, quick announcements. I'm passing out the program for tomorrow's All College Day. As you see, it's a, a major undertaking by our, our staff. Uh, Patty Jones, our Human Resources Director, and, and others uh, put a great deal of energy into it so that all of our staff have opportunities to uh, participate in a variety of kinds of things. Over the years, it's become I think a little less, uh, it's still a, it's a wonderful day. Please come out, even if you can only come for a little while. Um, but we try to uh, align a good deal of it with our strategic priorities. We don't want to uh, make it so overwhelmingly focused that people don't have a chance to uh, branch off and to do some different things. Uh, somebody help me out. How many people will we have out there tomorrow? Seven, eight hundred, a thousand, 1,200. 1200. Uh, so it's a pretty big undertaking. Um, Dr. Williams and her team used the afternoon for some very specific training in support of students. Dr. Cooper and the deans uh, meet with their faculty back there. I'm retention. sorry? Retention. Retention, retention, retention. <laughs> so anyway, I'm very, very proud of that. So, so thank you very much. I have uh, just uh, one or two other things that, uh, that I would like to share. Let me be sure if I didn't list them at the end. Um, the uh, nice things happen. We got an email this week. Uh, Sabrina stand up. I see Sabrina Crawford here. Sabrina is the staff person, but uh, a, a broad based faculty and staff group that puts together our accreditation report. You know that we submitted our five year report last year. Uh, it was, uh, of course, approved, and uh, we got some accolades for doing it. This week, we got an email from the accrediting board and said, we would like to use your five-year plan as the model for some of our training sessions during the December uh, national me uh, the regional meeting for the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. Now, I know a lot of schools that have gotten good accreditation reports. I don't know any that they called up and says, you want to use yours as a model. So let me compliment Sabrina and all of the faculty and staff who did that work. That's big stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <clears throat> public comments? None. Moving along, uh, approval of minutes. Could I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. Um, moved and second. Any discussion or changes? Mr. Chairman, that motion includes both sets of minutes. There's minutes from uh, August 19th, and then the joint meeting uh, with the school board. Okay. There's two sets of minutes, so just for clarification. You'd like to revise that? Both sets? I'll, I'll revise that <laughs> to include both sets. Both sets. Can I have a second? Second. Any discussion? No discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> Approved. As written. Monthly reports. Mr. Lang is not present with us. Mr. Miles. I have nothing to report at this time. Thank you very much. 
we are uh, moving the um, section six. We're going to talk about budget and finance for Mr. Gibbons because he might have to drop off here. So, um, could we start with uh, Doug and Jamel? You know, there good you morning. go. Sorry, just, good morning. <laughs> Today we're going to walk through the monthly financial report. On the first chart, we're currently showing the first six months of our fiscal year as far as the budget in blue and green, our revenue and our expense. And you can see for the first three months of the year through September, we're currently at $1.3 million above our revenue estimate and about $200,000 below our expense budget. As we look closer at revenue, in the top right-hand corner is the chart that you have seen before. It's the detail of the revenue and the budget. So that includes our state funding, which we're getting as we would anticipate, our student tuition and fees, and other revenues. So you can see in yellow that overall we're running about 1% over our revenue budget. The other charts that have been added allow us to monitor the impact of our enrollment strategies that we've been working on in relate to our financial budget. So on the top left, we're looking at total student tuition and fees, and year over year, we're up $1.3 million from this point last year. The bottom chart looks at just tuition revenue, and it's tracking different groups of our tuition to budget. So the blue is our 100% of our budget, and then the green shows where we are at this point in the year. Through September, we've pretty much brought in most of our revenue that we'll see for the fall term. And so we've budgeted that we would be at 40% of our revenue goal on tuition at this point in time. Um, the different categories, LD is lower division, UD would be upper division, so that we're looking at both lower and upper division, in-state and out-of-state, and then PSAV, which is our post-secondary adult vocational, those are our academies, such as fire and police that occur out at Allstate. Those don't follow that same traditional term trend, so the, the percentage that's lower isn't out of line with what we would expect. But the important point is that at the end, where we're budgeted to be at 40% of our tuition revenue, we're actually at 42% right now. Just as important in looking at how our enrollment initiative results have impacted our revenue, we need to look at how they're impacting the expenses that are going to contribute to that enrollment increase. So we've added some charts that look at adjunct expenses. Those are our direct teaching costs. So if you look down at the bottom, you have our year-over-year -year adjunct expense. And overall, we're slightly up from last year, but that was budgeted when we did our 14-15 budget. We've broken out adjunct in a couple of different buckets. We've got our adjuncts, which is our traditional adjuncts and teachers that we bring on board to assist in teaching. And then supplemental are expenses that we incur from our full-time faculty when they work above their traditional workload. So the top uh, chart actually shows that we're budgeted right now to be at 17% of our adjunct expense, and we're right there at 17%. So the important point to note is while we've been able to increase our tuition revenue and we've grown in enrollment, we've managed and controlled our adjunct expenses that could be directly tied to that. To the right is our overall look at all of our expenses and our operating budget, and you can see down at the bottom in yellow that we're about 1% overall underneath our, our expense. This last slide looks at the different funds that you approve during the budget process and our revenue tracking to them throughout the year. So again, the blue shows 100% of our revenue goal in these specific areas. First is the operating budget, which is what we've been talking about, and we're at 29% of that goal. Then you have fund two, our student activity fees. Fund three is our auxiliary budget, which actually feeds um, revenue to support student items in our operating budget. Our financial aid fee and then our capital improvement fee which is um, funding our construction and our capital outlay budget. And then the chart underneath, again, just shows year-over-year -year comparison and also lets you see the magnitude of the, the revenue and the dollar amounts in each of those funds. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I might, Jamel, um, operating is a function of when the state sends us the lottery money and other things, so that, that we know it'll mm -hmm. be 100 at the end. Uh, and we've... We know that, that we're up at, you know, the 40 or 41 percent. What would cause financial aid fee and capital improvement fee, which are really tied to this, the, the overall enrollment and tuition levels, mm -hmm. right? It's a percentage. So how, how do those get to be eight or, in, in one case, 15 or 16 percent higher than, than just the regular? 
Well, what's causing that? And we're doing some research now to see if you look at our tuition revenue, what's up at 60% of what I would have anticipated to have happen is our out of state lower <coughs> division enrollment. So we're researching what that is and where that's coming from. But whereas your student activity fee is attached only to your in-state tuition, your financial aid fee and your capital improvement fee is actually a calculation also built off of that out-of-state fee. So we're seeing that incremental growth in those two categories as well. Just for board members, the, when we talk about tuition and other fees, those are tracked. The capital improvement fee is a percentage of the tuition. The financial aid fees a percentage of tuition. So as one goes up, the other would mm -hmm. go up. But I, I just couldn't square how one would go up half again as fast. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe uh, you've all been provided information on our proposed uh, recognition payment. We, uh, we have provided you with uh, this information that sort of breaks it down in that for budgeted employees, that'd be faculty, career, and, and administrative professional, that it would be 2%, just a one-time 2% of annual salary. And the other groups that are, uh, are OPS adjunct, OPS is our temporary employee group, adjunct and student employment, uh, would be 2% of earnings from July up, whoops, up through December. Uh, at, at about the midway point, so roughly 2% of their earnings. Just to give you a sense of the funding, Jamel already mentioned that our total, our revenue is up 1.3 million, but we had also budgeted a contingency with additional money that could be used in the event we decided to do something or make a recommendation uh, for a, an, a, a recognition payment. And so we've got the cost is about 1.6 million, and we've got the 1.6 million budgeted in order to cover it. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Doug and Jamal? Are we ready to make a motion to accept the proposal? I would move to accept the proposal. Okay. Second. It's been motion and seconded. Any discussion? Other than thank you. Yes. Oh. Thank you, and I'm Thank glad you. we had the money. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> all, in, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion approved. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Wonderful. Good morning again. Um, this morning, I'm here to share with you the succession plan for our <laughs> chief campus officers, our provosts, um, here at the St. Petersburg, Gibbs, and Seminole campuses. Um, two of our most effective leaders will be retiring this summer, Dr. Jim Oliver and Dr. Karen Kaufman-White. We will be celebrating their successes later in the academic year, but we are certainly going to miss their leadership and the roles that they have played in our successes here at St. Petersburg College. So now we find ourselves getting ready here to hire two uh, chief campus officers. So our model here at St. Petersburg College is different than the model for most of the colleges regarding chief campus officers and provosts. So we need to keep in mind that we'll be looking for individuals who are full of, uh, I would say, various leadership skills. May not be just academic as the um, normal colleges are with provosts. Most provosts are chief academic officers, our provosts, our chief student success officers in their role is to make sure that our students succeed. So we'll be looking for a very different group um, of individuals as viable candidates. We're looking for energetic, highly visible, engaging folks who are great communicators, who are collaborative, who can work within the provost council and keep the college-wide view in mind while you know, helping their campuses succeed. So we are seeking those who possess organizational strategy and promote self-development for their staff and progression. So in front of you, you have a more detailed plan in your notebooks with the timeline and who's who in regards to our secession plan. We'll be having a national search. We'll be um, looking at, of course, our website, Higher Ed Jobs, the Chronicle for Higher Ed, Diverse Jobs, LinkedIn, and other social media to get the job advertisement out. Those who are interested will have 13 weeks 
to submit their credentials um, to the college. That gives people time through the holidays and things of that nature to gather their materials and submit a great proposal. Our screening committee is broad. It is not based on um, the senior leadership only. We have career service staff members from our career service council. They will be represented. We will have faculty represented, deans, provosts, um, and other um, leaders involved in the screening process. We'll also have um, with that, that the great screening committee. They will be submitting their top recommendations. We'll make sure that the pool is diverse, and then we will start the interview process. So the interviews will take place starting February, and the first round of interviews will take place in an online setting. This will give the interview team a chance to get a sneak peek at the candidates and um, ask um, questions to see if they're ready to come to campus for the official interview. We will have the community involved in the interview process, so you'll see them um, involved in that as well. The second round is where the screening committee has given their top candidates from the first round of interviews, and then those candidates will come to campus for a visit. That visit will be sort of like a round robin. They will have an opportunity to meet with the provost council. They will meet with the campus team, which will include faculty, students, and other individuals in the community. They will interview with the Senior Vice President of Student Services and Instructional Affairs. And from those interviews, we will be submitting the names of the top candidates to the President for an interview. The President will interview all finalists. From his interview, we will be making a decision and bringing them before you to the April Board. Any, any, any questions? questions? How do you envision the community being involved? Well, when we have the interviews, we will invite those who have been involved at the college to sit right at the table and, and be able to ask questions. True involvement. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, we did that in both of the recent rounds of hiring at Allstate right. and <coughs> particularly at Tarpon because of ownership. That, that works well. I, I want to be, I want, this one is, is has, Tanja's done a good job to, to sort it all out. We have two very critical positions mm -hmm. on two campuses. As I always say, I have two, two children. You would never get them mixed up, okay? We have two campuses here that you would never get mixed up, <laughs> okay? They both have served in a, in a capacity. Our strength is, is that we have a lot of differences that come together to make St. Petersburg College. This one has, has its own variation. Karen is the only woman who serves in a provost position, so we know that when the dust settles, one or both yeah, of these positions, need to be. we can't end up with just males in provost positions. And what we're trying to avoid is making two separate pools, because if you make one choice out of one pool right away, then it the could immediately the limit channel. the second pool, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if, and, and this way, we would keep them in tandem, have everybody participate, and then see what the natural leadership talent might be that's the best fit mm -hmm. on either of the campuses and then balance the, the gender or other diversity issues as we get to the finalists, okay? So it takes a little finesse at the end, but don't separate it at the beginning because you might end up in a bad place at the end. So that's what we're trying to work on. I think it's going to work out just fine. I think it's going to be really, really exciting to do it. It won't be, a, and everything happens with the cards face up. Uh, it's a matter of moving it through. And we've got plenty of time. There's no reason this won't work. Both Karen and Jim will be here. Jim is uh, out the door on May 31st, I think. Karen has a, a little more time. Um, so if we come here in April, we should be in pretty good shape. Um, happy to have your support at any questions, comments, but it's we'll get internal candidates. We'll get a lot of external candidates. Yeah. All the, the visibility that we're getting, people are... I, I know that people are seeing us as a place to come make a contribution and build a career and move on at, at some future date, so we're open to that. I'm curious, how much does a national search cost? Ooh. Patty, a national search expense? Actually, because most of what we're doing is online, it's very affordable. I would say well less than $20,000. I'm sorry, was your question if we hired somebody to do a national search or just for us to advertise for a national search? For I'm us to do an, for a national search 
it, it was less than 20,000. That's yeah. Yeah. the way we're doing Very it. reasonable. Yeah. So we're not doing this through hiring a search firm. No. We're no. doing it. That that's be, what I thought. No. Okay, that that's, that's why you're holding the cost bucks, down. Yeah. So. Right. yeah. Right. Conjure was very successful with the uh, the tarpon and, and the uh, Allstate one. I think we know it just at the time of these two, and, and there's some nuances. So thanks. We'll keep you informed. Just wanted you to know it's starting. Thank you very much. Dr. Oliver and Dr. Raggio. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm actually very excited to be able to present the uh, Seminole Community Educational Ecosystem to you this morning. Um, this has been a real point of pride of mine for the last year and a half, um, as it's a, a, a little bit different idea about who really takes responsibility for education in a community. Um, they often say that, actually it's a, it's a West African uh, proverb, that it takes a village to raise a child. I would extend that and say it takes a community to educate a child. Because I think that's ultimately where the responsibility should belong. Um, we'll start out with what is an ecosystem. Um, I actually I saw the, the term educational ecosystem referred to the first time when I was at a SACS meeting. And it was the president of Valencia College who had made that reference and really talked about it in the sense of a kind of a macro level. So he was communicating in the sense that students move around. They move from uh, colleges to universities, potentially back but the idea of that move in, in, in an in a enclosed system. I took the idea and, and really began to kind of think about it in the sense of how that would look more at a micro level. So how do we bring that down into a, a specific community? Um, and we looked at it from the perspective of, of the seminal area and looked at the relationship. We have the various schools, the elementary schools, middle, high, St. Petersburg College, and how they work together to collaborate to improve education in that specific area. So the idea was born out of a meeting that we had in January 2013. Um, and the discussion was, how do we begin to pull these pieces together? So we had a joint meeting at the time. There was about six or seven schools that were involved. Um, and we facilitated the meeting. My, my role had been as a community member. I'm the SAC of the Bowder Elementary. And to bring forth, how do we bring the schools together? How do we change the role of what the school advisory committees are and how they existed? Because traditionally, they had been more of a sense of a a body, a board that would sit back, listen to the principal, okay the school improvement plan, hear information on data, what was being done, and make comments, but that was really it. It wasn't really an action committee. It wasn't really involvement. So I, I've been a SAC chair for a number of years. My wife's actually a, a school teacher there about elementary, and thought about how can we go to the next step? How can we make this an action-based group? How can we bring folks together? Um, and it really struggled with the idea of who ultimately is responsible for education. So we started with this first meeting and brought these five schools together. And they were roll, rolled up under the idea of Seminole High School, so all the feeder schools for Seminole High, and had a discussion about how we could work together as a group to improve education. So currently, we've evolved a lot since that time in, in January 2013, and now have um, 14 schools that are involved in, in the ecosystem. And a lot of the meetings that have occurred in this area, this is kind of the central western part of Pinellas County, have worked together in a, in a few meetings now where we've had the SAC chairs and the principals get together and meet and, and have conversations and look at how to improve. Specifically organized in the sense of three different subcommittees. As that original meeting determined, there was three ways we could approach this improvement. The first is internal partnerships. And Dr. Oliver actually chairs that particular subcommittee. Um, and the focus on that one is how do we look at each school and understand what are the strengths of that particular school and also what are the needs of that school and build an inventory that we can work out together in, as part of the ecosystem. So that's we're working on that component as, as we speak. The next area is community outreach and uh, Barbara Clare who is, leads the Career Academies of Seminole uh, is responsible for that particular subcommittee. But that's how, how do you bring the community into the conversation? Because right now if you're a business and you want to contribute and give back to the community, you have to go to each school. You know, unless you're at the very high level of the Pinellas Education Foundation, a lot of discussion has to be down at the local level. Um, and that makes it cumbersome for people to get involved. Um, my daughter plays uh, soccer, competitive soccer. So uh, this time of year, I spend a lot of my time out on the soccer field. Um, but I look around and I'm amazed. There's parents there that are volunteering to coach. There's parents there that could get up early in the morning and paint the fields to make sure they're ready. There's parents at the concession stands. There's parents there volunteering their time 
for every element associated <coughs> with soccer. Do you honestly believe education is less important than playing soccer? Um, what we need is a forum and a mechanism to be able to have these interactions, communications, and I think the ecosystem is one example of that. Um, the last committee is improved educational pathways, and Wendy Bryan, who's the uh, recent new principal at Seminole Middle, is responsible for that specific subcommittee. But that's really the movement as we have students that transition from kindergarten up to post-secondary education. And a lot of times it's the, it's not my fault, it's your fault discussion. You know, as a college, we have those discussions with, oh, you brought these students to us, they're not ready. It's, it's the high school's fault. And you have the high school look down at the middle school and say, our students aren't ready, it's the middle school stop. And then you have the same thing from middle school to elementary. How do we improve those pathways? How do we have those discussions and build that focus? So this committee has very, been very focused on how do we get fifth grade teachers and sixth grade teachers together having conversations about aligning curriculum, aligning competencies? How do we have eighth grade and ninth grade conversations? How do we have 12th grade and college conversations about making sure our competencies are aligned so the students have the seamless pathways they move through the educational system? Um, and this really was kind of some of the initial work even before the larger ecosystem was developed and a process we're going to talk about in just a minute, which is the transition to middle school. I'm going to turn it over to, uh, the, we just had our most recent meeting, September 11th. We had over 70 members from 13 different schools attend. Um, and it was really building the discussion of these subcommittees and how we move forward as a group. Uh, let me turn over to Dr. Oliver to have some discussion on some of the individual projects. Yeah, as Jesse mentioned, the ecosystem is really about connecting people and resources at the member uh, the schools. And um, it started out really about transition, transition from elementary to middle, middle to high, <clears throat> and um, um, high, of course, to post-secondary education. Uh, and, and really the focal point initially was transition to middle school. And that's very important because it wasn't the college saying, we're the college, we're here to do it for you. It was about creating that web of interaction among the members that brought the ecosystem its power. And, and so that transition to middle school became an initial activity, and the notion of transitions has become mm -hmm. a consistent theme. Of course, from the campus perspective, we're very interested in, in that connection between high schools and college. Um, but, but even earlier than that, we've worked now to bring for a program to bring all the fifth graders uh, for a campus visit. And this year, we piloted it last year, this year all nine of the area elementary schools are coming to the Seminole campus to meet for a two or three hour program. Kind of picture yourself here. We show them some of the programs, we have a little bit of fun, we do a motivational talk, but every fifth grader in the area comes to the campus. If you're interested, Starkey Elementary is coming this Thursday, you're welcome to join us. It's really exciting to see the students and the parents and the teachers come and get excited about <coughs> college. Um, we also have several visits by uh, middle and high school students, uh, students in the AVID program. AVID stands for Advancement via Individual Determination. It's a special program in, in middle and high schools for students who are, they, they call them the academic middle to get them ready for academic, for college eligibility and academic success. And so we try to bring those folks here to a kind of picture yourself here proposition to make them be thinking from fifth grade on about transitioning on to college. Um, the, in addition to those uh, particular groups, uh, we, we look for smaller groups um, that we can connect to affinity groups. So, for example, we bring in the Student Government Association, this is last year's group from Largo High School, to come into the Seminole campus to meet with the student government leaders at the Seminole campus to talk about student government activities. Um, we're hosting the Future Business Leaders of America Regional Conference here this year. And we're working with faculty to faculty exchanges so we can look in areas like math to get teachers and students together working on the college campus. Again, transition services. Um, <clears throat> the, the latest uh, iteration of this is really an idea that, that Dean Susan Demers has had for several years uh, about being much more intentional um, in our outreach to college-bound juniors and seniors and their parents. Um, and so we're creating a program, we're piloting aspects of it this year. We expect to have the whole thing settled next year, a five-part program that would start with college exploration, would move on to making the most of a campus visit. Those would both be for juniors in the spring of the year. Then we'd move in the fall to career exploration using our career, career assessment tools. Uh, and then a paying for college session, and the last, which we're going to actually be piloting this year uh, for our seniors uh, in February of 2015, and then it'll be February each year, is a program fair. And the program fair is designed to answer the question, what can I do with a major in X? 
And we're going to have a series of TED Talks in our digitorium so that we can have quick 10-minute reviews of, of different programs. And then we're going to have tables for all of the uh, programs out, kind of um, uh, tabletop exhibits. Um, this is great not only for the high school seniors, but it's helpful for our students who have yet to decide. We have about 80% of our students who know what they want to do, but 20% of our incoming freshmen still don't, haven't made a decision. We'll get them to those tables, get them participating as well, and think that that will be a real benefit for not only our students, but that transition for the high school students. Jesse? So one of our, our, our strongest community partners has been uh, Richard uh, Alandon, who's with the Anona Methodist Church. And he was working on a, a similar kind of model that evolved, and we've kind of merged a little bit on some of the ideas. Um, but he started out with uh, Ridgecrest 360, working specifically with their elementary school and building community resources. And that has since blossomed now, working with the ecosystem to Bowder Elementary 360 and Seminole Middle 360. And he's worked on with them on programs to find out what the needs of the various program, uh, schools are. Uh, in the middle school, he's actually started a thousand male mentor program. Uh, and the advantages of that are these students now can work academically, can have opportunities to visit the colleges, and can also be in a situation where they can mentor sixth and seventh grade male students and help them through the educational process. Um, in essence, we think it's a good idea, you know, and they often say good ideas have legs. You know, I don't know that this, the, the, the SAC model that we created has, has to be the model that fits everywhere. I think we can customize a model. I think it needs to be somewhat organic. Um, and I think it needs to be community focused. You know, we talked about all the resources that we've used to the college to help the ecosystem be successful. But the emphasis is that students go to college. It doesn't have to be St. Petersburg College. It has to be that students go to college. And especially I'm excited about the College 101 program because a lot of students, their families aren't having conversations around the dinner table about college. And they're getting to the last minute at the end of their senior year and then it's really too late. So by building this model and allowing students to know what are those steps beginning their year, senior year, or junior year and helping them be successful uh, is, is a good model. And I think this is a, an opportunity for a strong partnership with this school district. Any questions? I have a comment. I think junior year is too late. Well, we, we, some of our programs start with fifth graders. Um, and that was always an interesting discussion because when we first piloted the fifth grade program, you know, some of the dialogue was, how does that help improve your fall enrollment? You know, I, I can guarantee none of those fifth graders are going to start in that, in, you know, that, in that following fall. Um, <laughs> but what it does is start to build that excitement about college. Um, we actually ha had, had some quotes that, that were pretty exciting about those students, fifth graders who hadn't really even thought about college nor had conversations with their family. Um, and were there at a college campus and saw what it felt like. And, and we had a, a great motivational uh, speaker, one of our outreach coordinators, um, who just mesmerized them in conversations about how important college is uh, and how it opens up doors and opportunities. Uh, and I, I, one of the great examples he gave is he said, I always used to get in trouble in school because I talked all the time. Now I find a job that I'm very passionate about of which I get to talk all the time. So, you know, building your strengths, building your passion. So great connectiveness to those fifth graders, and they were just mesmerized. So we, we are starting earlier and having those conversations to get folks excited and realize it opens up doors and it provides opportunity. We, we think that, that there's a program at the elementary school in that fifth grade, and that's pretty settled now. Uh, and we're working on College 101. We do, we do know there's a role in the middle schools, and we're getting a lot of, as a matter of fact, we're getting um, visit fatigue. Um, from so many folks wanting to come to visit, all those avid students wanting to come and visit. We're also putting students in the schools. Uh, one of the other early successes is a uh, psychology class sends students to mentor at Ridgecrest Elementary School. And that's been a powerful experience for those students. So I, 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 just to use a good word, organically, what's happening is we're finding people are now coming to us. And people are finding connections because they know that the ecosystem exists as a place to hold them. Uh, but, but I think your point's well taken. If we wait until the senior year of high school, it's too late. But for junior and senior year, we think we can put together in this College 101 a program for folks who have been conditioned all along to be able to answer some of those questions, some of those questions answered. And mine's just based on experience, but they don't, you know, I mean, I know you guys are tired of hearing about my kids, but <laughs> she needed, my daughter needed it in ninth grade. Yeah. She needed to understand, and no matter how many times I tried to explain the importance of that ninth and tenth grade year, mom knows nothing. So, um, you know, she's in Tallahassee now, and all of a sudden I know everything, but um, it just, I, I think ninth, I think ninth grade is very, very important for those kids to have that experience and get that excitement because in their junior year, 
everyone's talking about it. So it's mm -hmm. less of a, oh, aha moment kind of thing. I and mean, then the light bulb goes off, I think, for them naturally. In ninth grade, they still think they're kids and they still don't see where they're going and what's next. And yeah, I mean, that's just, again, my two cents, my opinion. It, but. And in high schools, I mean, the best we can work with the districts <laughs> to help them with those pathways. I mean, the superintendents made a commitment that the students are gonna graduate from Dallas County Schools either being workforce ready or college ready. And that we, as a college, have resources we can help build on that. Um, the really, the, the idea of the ecosystem is the mechanism. It's really the place where folks can come meet and have conversations, and those conversations are all strategically focused on student success. Is there a member of the Pinellas Education Foundation who's part of this? There is not. We don't have a, there's not a rep that? N not yet, but that's certainly a good idea and something we can, can work with is that build that partnership. But, but they're aware of us. Um, Terry <laughs> has scheduled a program on our <laughs> campus next week on, what, on what's happening with our boys. Um, he approached us to have the session in the Digitorium, and we have a program working with our, with our men's students, the MAX program, and so we're partnering with him on that. The other thing, you probably are aware That's that they've- That's gonna be a fantastic program. It, it is, and they, they've just rolled out a new career assessment tool it's called Future Plan, mm -hmm. um, and we've been talking to them, we have focus too, we've been talking to them about things, so. Is, is there a device-based gym, that career, or is it a PC? I, you know, I've just, I've just, they just had a meeting with our staff last Friday, and we have not seen it all, but it's something that we need to investigate because I think us working with them on career assessments early uh, is a key piece of this. But So we're, we're working with the foundation on, on a couple of fronts. Mr. Chairman, when we, uh, when we had the meeting with, with the school board, there was a, a robust dialogue about working together to support students moving through. This is as exciting a program. We don't own... It's not how can we write checks fast enough to make something happen. We're using our time and talent to nurture other time and talent mm -hmm. toward the, uh, the better end. But if the result is all the fifth graders in the district show up on our campus at some point, that's a fundamentally good thing for everybody. We have no other way of getting all the fifth graders on campus in a reasonable place. If we have materials then that help parents understand there is money for your kid to go to college, can't start that dialogue too early. There's the aha moment when you're a junior or senior is to figure out how we're going to pay for all this. So I, I think this model, um, we ought to continue to watch two great educators given guidance, but we're going to make a big landing in, in the Midtown area and, you know, providing organic kinds of contributions without us being the only dialogue seem to me to have great potential mm -hmm. for helping that community. I, my experience in, the, in uh, let me take a second on Midtown, is there's a lot of energy there. It's, the whole is way less than the sum of the parts right now. And I think if we could come in with a, a model that says, want to try something different, I think we could get the effectiveness much, much higher with the same level of energy. So we'll see how it works. These, this is a, a wonderful program. It's, um, you know, two good educators leading the way for us. Thanks. Thank you very Thank much. You. Nice job. Nice. Uh, moving down to human resources, the one A personnel report. If it's in your coming up on. Do we have a personnel report on the screen, or is it just in the book? It's just in the, in book. the book. Okay. Um, can I have a uh, motion? So moved. Second. Moving second. Any discussion? None. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'll oppose a motion carried. Health insurance update, Mr. Jones, and leadership development plan. Good morning. I'm here to update you on something that's happened since I last reported to you about our insurance benefits. On September 25th, we were informed that Continental American, who offers our indemnity plans for hospitalization, was going to stop offering it to all of our employee groups. Now, this is a voluntary plan, no cost to the college. Very quickly, within a few days, we pulled together our benefits committee, who unanimously agreed that we want all employees to continue having the opportunity to select a hospital indemnity plan. And we were fortunate enough to have, at this late hour, the opportunity to partner with Allstate. Allstate already offers our cancer and accident plans to our employees. Um, Open enrollment starts in a couple of weeks. Due to the timing of this, we were unable to go out to market. I'm committing to you that we will do that next year. 
but we are very pleased that on behalf of our employees we were able to come up with a solution and the cost to them actually will be lower. Just a matter of information, we're, we're monitoring that we do a good job with health. We want to be sure our, our commitment to our employees is to keep things as steady as we can until we have to change them. This one was a must change, but it's really behind the scenes. Nobody should feel any, any pressure on that. We bring it as a matter of public record is all. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Law. My name is Brian Miles. I'm the Associate uh, General Counsel here at the college, and of course this is Patty Jones, Associate Vice President of Human Resources. We're here this morning to talk to you about two internal leadership development programs that the college recently created and that the college intends to launch in January 2015. Now the impetus for these two programs is threefold. One, the college uh, recognized some time ago the need for succession planning to develop a steady pipeline of leaders who could step up at a moment's notice and compete for key leadership positions as some of our current leaders uh, depart for one reason or another. Two, we wanted to provide some professional development opportunities for current and emerging leaders. And three, we wanted to uh, give supervisors the tools they need to create, implement, and manage change at the individual business unit level. Uh, there are two programs, as I mentioned. One is called Leadership SPC, and I'll be briefing this program. The other is called SPC Delta Academy, or Change Academy, and Patty will be briefing that program. Patty? Sure. Okay. So the SPC Delta Academy is for current supervisors, both, both new and experienced. And the focus for them is going to be on change, affecting change, managing change, communi communicating change. We want them to become change agents at the most fundamental basic level, and through that, we're going to have continued transformation throughout the institution. Key concepts include needs assessment, leading through change, conflict resolution, team building, and individual skills development. And we're going to be um, having two approaches to this. One is going to be spending a significant amount of time on situational leadership. And the other part is strengthening the functional and technical skills the supervisors need to be successful. And I will go into more detail on that in a moment. Whereas the intended audience for SPC Delta Academy is current supervisors, the target participants for Leadership SPC will be full-time faculty, staff, and administration. And specifically, we're looking for current leaders and emerging leaders. And by emerging leaders, we uh, are talking about employees who demonstrate leadership potential and who have a strong desire in serving in leadership positions uh, here at SPC or perhaps throughout the Florida College system at some point in the future. The mission is to provide them professional development opportunities. The intent is to expose them to SPC's operations, uh, SPC's infrastructure, and the communities that we serve, and to also give them some leadership training. Our curriculum will be two-part. The first part will be based on the five core competencies for community college leaders as developed by the American Association of Community Colleges, the AACC. And you can see some of the key concepts on the right-hand corner of your screen at the bottom. Those are essentially the five core competencies developed by the AACC. The second part of the curriculum will be uh, best practices in leadership. Uh, and these best practices will come not only from higher education, but also industry. It's important to point out that this curriculum will be taught by internal and external speakers, so we should have a good cross-section of ideas and content. Two approaches, one focus, uh, the focus being uh, leadership. Um, you can see here the duration of the SPC Delta Academy will be for six weeks. Uh, sessions will meet generally on a Friday uh, each week for those six weeks. Leadership SPC will be a little bit uh, longer. We'll run that program for six months and we'll meet generally on a Friday, uh, one Friday per month. Uh, we will have a three-day trip to Tallahassee, which I'll speak more about in just a bit. The cohort size for both programs is 24 individuals. Um, and uh, the announcement for both of these programs will be made tomorrow at All College Day. Patty and I will be conducting two informational sessions for interested uh, applicants. 
Uh, and then the launch date, of course, is uh, January 2015. Okay, a little bit more detail for you. This is a sample day, which actually has to be the plan for day one. Well, the focus of that will be expectations for SPC leaders. And I want to preface this by sharing with you that we are partnering with Leadership Research Institute, specifically John Street Matter, who will be co-facilitating this and three other sessions with us. Um, participants through this will discuss what is expected of them as part of the leadership team at SPC. They will identify the fundamentals of leadership as customer service, which if you know John, you know that's one of his um, main themes. And there will be a capstone project for the group. And there are two other important elements that I want to share with you. And one of, one of these is that we're going to be equipping participants to develop their own ongoing leadership development plan. And the other thing is we will be sustaining the program. So this is a cohort-based program. They're not going to be abandoned when it's done. We will continue to have cohort check-in meetings, specialized uh, leadership training for them. And this is a sample day for Leadership SPC, and in fact, this is the first full day of training that we have uh, programmed. This will occur on Friday, January 23rd. And you can see at the top that the overarching focus of this particular day is one of the AACC core competencies, and that is organizational strategy. Uh, in the morning, Dr. And all, Dr. Law and I will speak about SPC's mission, vision, and goals. And um, then we'll transition into a session about SPC governance and we'll talk about uh, the role of the president and the board of trustees. And I would cordially invite you to come and participate in this session. And in fact, uh, in a couple of weeks, I'll be sending a formal invitation uh, to see which of you board members would like to contribute in this role. In the afternoon, we will have a uh, session on behavioral assessment, and each of the cohort participants will be assessed. Um, and then we'll uh, move into a discussion about organizational culture and ethics. And we'll conclude the day with our uh, uh, discussion about a capstone project. Our goal here is to split the 24 cohort participants into small groups, have them select a capstone project topic. It's a project that they will work on for the duration of the six months, and the project will benefit the college. Uh, they will, the, the participants will be asked to brief the results of their project on June 19th, which is the final day of uh, Leadership SPC. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, these instructional sessions will be supplemented uh, by outside reading from uh, different sources, uh, again, focused on higher education, also pulling some concepts and materials in from, from industry. Those are the two programs I mentioned to you, uh, the, the focus and also the goals of those programs. Uh, each one has a unique twist to it, uh, but we're very excited about the results that we think these programs will produce. And with that in mind, I turn it over to you for questions or concerns. Thank you. I have uh, just, just one. First of all, I haven't, haven't been involved in public and private companies this is this is very similar to things that they do from a succession planning standpoint and you know first of all is is the commitment to do it and then kind of kind of keeping it going and, and using it for for what good it is which is to make the organization better um, question on on the Delta Academy the the size is 24 supervisors are those chosen by anybody or is it like first come first serve or how, how does that work uh, that uh, great question because that's the differentiator here uh, the three senior vice presidents will select the 24 individuals so that it is people uh, in leadership roles uh, mm -hmm. we expect we can get through everybody over a period of time but I don't think it's any secret one of our major challenges every day is managing change mm -hmm. getting people comfortable <laughs> with it getting people into the dialogue and uh, th those will be self-nominated, but the three senior vice presidents will okay. recommend those to me. Good, good. The other is much more leadership panelists, leadership same right. key, where people can, it, it, there's, there's a more personal benefit, I think. You, you, people like to do that, and they can grow their skill. They learn more about the college, make themselves ready for something else. The, the Delta Academy is focused on helping us get things done yeah. and yeah. building skills that, that they'll need. So no, I think it's good. I think it's a great program. 
Right. We've other? got budget for we we actually budgeted in the uh, in the operating budget this year for this this project. I forget the exact amount. Both are fifteen or twenty thousand bucks, I think. And and uh, I forget how we pay for the trip to Tallahassee, but that's half of the SPC trip. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll let you know how it works. We'll bring some folks in. Thank you. I'm really excited about this. This, this is good stuff for the college. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, uh, Bay Pines contractor. Uh, Who is handling that? Who's handling uh, okay. that's Jim. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is the third large capital project in which we have employed our new screening and selection, the two-step process that we initiated at the uh, Midtown project and then subsequently used for the selection of the Clearwater Library contractor, this one being the third. A um, lot of excitement about this project at the Bay Pine site. It's a, it's a landmark site. It's going to be a signature project. There was a ton of excitement from the architects and the contractors who attended our 16 to 18 of them attended our pre-submission conference. We got formal submittals from 14 firms. We shortlisted them. Our, our screening committee consisted of uh, Dr. Chapin, some of his members, of his staff, uh, City of Seminole was represented, Pinellas County Schools was represented, other community members, other St. Pete College staff were represented. We shortlisted the firms to three. Mr. Oliver and Dr. Law served as the selection team. They viewed the presentations and uh, came up with the ranking that is before you today for approval. Thank you. Mr. Oliver, any? No, comments? I think, uh, you know, the, uh, again, this followed the, uh, the process that we used for Midtown, and, and I think it worked well to, to vet out the, the finalists, and then it was really kind of up to them at that point to, uh, uh, to do their presentation and, and show us their qualifications. So I think it worked well. Good. Well, hearing that, if I could have a motion. Mr. Oliver, is it your recommendation to go forward with the number one rank? It is. Um, it is. Then I would make a motion to uh, go forward with the Biltmore Construction Group. That was second. Approved and second. I mean, motion and second. Any discussion? Mr. Gibbons is back on. <laughs> yeah, I'm back on. Thank you. Heavy breathing. Hearing no discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 All, all opposed. Uh, motion carried. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, moving down to academic matters. Online education update. Good morning. Good morning, Susan Kalerik. I wanted to bring you an update. As you know, we've started the online revitalization process, and I want to bring you this update on the migration and revitalization as we go forward. Migration refers to the transfer of courses and the training of faculty and students in the new system. We're moving from ANGEL to Desire to Learn, and there's a migration process involved in that. We ran a pilot in the summer. Uh, 490 faculty participated. That is a duplicated number, so faculty did participate both in the summer and the fall session. 21,000 enrollments, and again, students may have been involved in more than one course in that time. Um, during that pilot, we did a lot of data analysis. We collected data from the faculty orientation and the student orientations, as well as surveys so that we could move to a process improvement plan. We made a number of changes in both the orientations and with the proof of concept, which was how we will actually transfer courses between those two systems. The biggest change became with the uh, faculty certification. We have moved to a new model that was more scalable. We needed to move from 300 trained faculty to over 1,000 trained faculty in under three months. Uh, it was a rather big project, so we needed a new method that we could do that. We developed a system with 15 faculty facilitators. These are faculty who were already working within the system, who are now leading cohorts of 75 other faculty, and those faculty are actually in the system and showing that they can accomplish certain tasks within the system as they move forward. This has been going on for six weeks now, and it's moving along very well. Uh, we have a number of faculty who have already completed. Um, but the main purpose of changing it was to allow faculty to be uh, mentored 
and encouraged by other faculty members as they move forward. Uh, completion rates, uh, the old version we had 329 faculty who had completed and during round one we have over a thousand faculty enrolled and have moved through completions. These are numbers actually from last Tuesday. We update them each Tuesday afternoon. The tasks are completely online and asynchronous, but we are also holding face-to-face -face training sessions for faculty who prefer those types of learning situations. And we've had over 779 faculty attend those sessions on each of the campuses. And again, that is a duplicated number. Faculty who have attended one session tend to come back and attend others as well. But faculty have the option of doing it completely online um, at their own pace or attending the training sessions. Uh, but they all have to complete the tasks online. In the move from ANGEL to my courses, it is a translation process from one system to another. What we found during the proof of concept phase in the summertime was that faculty who had their courses removed were spending a lot of time on clerical tasks. And this took them away from teaching and interacting with students. So we implemented a new process of course preparation where we have OPS staff hired who are now going in and cleaning up the course, um, cleaning up text, fonts, uh, links, quizzes, things of that nature, which is saving faculty quite a bit of time. The best thing about this is that faculty can now concentrate on the content, not looking at the actual text involved. We are moving approximately 2,400 courses before January. So it's a very large project that we're working on at the moment. We've broken it out by department. The deans have sent the courses to us, and we're in the process of moving between 150 and 300 courses per week that are being cleaned, prepped, and then moved on to the faculty so that they can prepare. We started the process September 2nd, and we'll finish on December 1st. This gives us a five-week buffer to pick up any courses that we might have missed along the way, but it also allows faculty the opportunity to get into their courses and be very comfortable with the new system before classes start in January. We also, of course, have to train the students in the new system. So we had a student orientation that uh, began in the summertime. We've had about 2,000 hits on that course each week since it started. So students are not only going to it in the beginning, but they're coming back to it as a resource as they go through the term. We again are taking feedback from those students, modifying this, and one thing that the students had let us know was it was a good information, but it didn't allow them to practice. So we are building simulations into the new one, and that'll be ready December 1st, um, and it'll be open to all students, faculty, and staff. So anyone will have access to the system, particularly for advisors and Learning Resource Center staff so they can support students as well. We have an extensive communication plan that we're working on with marketing and strategic information. There's three phases for three different groups, um, different communications for faculty, students, and staff. Um, so the first phase began in August uh, with informing for the faculty and we've been moving on through next steps, which is the training phase. So information for students begins this week, moving on to building interest and getting them excited about the change, um, and then moving on to next steps for the students, which will start December 1st. We're gonna use multiple communication channels, Twitter, feed, Facebook, whatever we can use to reach everyone who needs that information, so that there's no surprises in January. Everyone is ready to move into the new system. Can I answer any questions for you on the process? How'd you get this done in two months since you just got here? <laughs> um, I have an amazing team that's oh, okay. been working on this. The ID team and the LMS administration team, um, as well as the new student success group, has been uh, focused particularly on the communication plan. Very impressive. Thank you. Generally, how long is the training taking online? The training, if a faculty member reads through the instructions and simply does the tasks involved, it's about two and a half hours. Um, if they choose to attend face-to-face uh, -face sessions, then it'd probably be about nine. Um, and those faculty who have gone in and looked at every single video on the, we have a lot of screencasts that show them examples mm -hmm. in the online environment, that can be up to a 14 hours. So it really does vary depending on the faculty member's preference. 
Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, looking at 6E, 2, and 3, uh, just it's in your notebook. A couple curriculum changes, certifications. Anything to add, sir? No, sir. These are in the normal range of, uh, of credit course adjustments. Uh, Dr. Cooper, did you okay. see Dr. Cooper? Okay. Making eye contact. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Law, these are two uh, curriculum memos for your approval. The first is with the academic side of the house. This is an a, a attempt to embed some industry certifications to better serve our students, as well as bringing forth a, a new math course that we once had uh, for our intermediate algebra course. Since we know there are students who can bypass developmental ed, this would give them a four credit course instead of a three credit course extra time in the lab, more time on task in hopes of um, ensuring their success. And then the second memo is from our workforce and professional development. These are existing courses that we are making some changes to to better serve our students, adding some courses at the request of one of our partners, and then an additional course as part of the grant in biomedical technology. Thank you. Any questions? Could I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Moved and second. No discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Uh, motion carries. Workforce development a presentation. Mr. Chairman, this is uh, an item that I'm going to present. I've, I've been working, uh, Dr. Jim Connolly and uh, Jason Krupp, our Director of Workforce, have been helping me a great deal along with, with uh, Vice President Cooper and others. Over the last uh, a good long while, uh, obviously workforce is something that, that uh, I identify with a great deal, but on, on several occasions I've been in high-level public forums, Ms. Bello, and, and the, the, you've supported some of those, and we get people say nice things about the work we're doing at St. Petersburg College. It's very rewarding. At the same time, on those very same panels, people say, but I have jobs that I can't fill. That's, to me, that is the most significant criticism you can make of, of me as the leader of this college. We, we need to know we're doing everything in our power to help people get those jobs filled. And as I have reviewed what we're doing, I come to find out that indeed we do earn praise legitimately. Look, look at all that we have, uh, the associate, 1,000 associate in science degrees, uh, 1,100 workforce baccalaureate programs. These are annual totals. The licensure in the credit programs in dental, medical. I mean, you can't close your eyes and think of healthcare in Pinellas County without seeing St. Petersburg College as, as part of it. The customized training that, that Jim has led for, for years, certifications training in that area, skills training, um, our, our learn to earn with very short courses, 11,000 registrations in three years for people picking up specific skills, uh, GED prep. So, so I come to this, uh, our, our Public Safety Institute, all, all the work that, that we do at, at the Allstate Center and, and others and the firefighters. I mean, everything is in the thousands of experiences. The Collaborative Lab is a who's who of service to, to the Tampa Bay area. Uh, in, in this very room last month, we hosted the industry advisory committees. We had more than 500 people come to either a breakfast, a lunch, or a dinner. So, so none of this is intended to say we're doing the wrong stuff or we have to beat ourselves up over what's happening. Why change, though? I think we see several things that need to be brought to the fore. There's a shifted hiring market as a result of the recession. People are not going back to work in the old jobs all the time. There's a very changed entry into the workforce and that has proven to be very difficult. I think the assessment of where we are is people can't get themselves retrained. The global competition, there isn't, there isn't anything that isn't globally competitive now. We're, we're, we're working on any number of fields, okay? There's a very changed demand for preparedness. Employers have a very different discussion at the front door now as to what they're looking for and what their expectations are. 
And then you read the same headlines I do, the cost of college, the multi-year time commitment, is that the most valuable return on investment, is that for everybody, those kinds of things. I mean, uh, we, we could spend all our time talking about just those items. The new challenge, here's what I think is, is coming over the horizon, and we need to be ready. In fact, we need to address it. That's the purpose of today's uh, overview. A greatly increased demand for industry-certified training and competence. A shift from just degrees. Don't, don't throw out the old stuff. Don't, nobody's saying stop doing that. But there's a huge demand as at the front gate for saying, are you certified in? We saw that in the manufacturing. We see it in the healthcare. We see it in a variety of ways. That has not been our strongest suit for non-program, non-credit program certifications. There is a weakened demand for degrees and credit hours. That's not the only uh, credential that gets you a job now. It, again, please don't hear me. I'm not trying to beat us up, but I'm saying we're not doing all we can. There is a great demand for documented employee competence. We see it in healthcare. We, we're having discussions with the associate degree nurse. I saw Phil Nicotera come in. I was in his office last week. I mean, nobody criticizes the work we do in associate degree nursing. And Phil's telling me, the hospitals are saying, yeah, but if they had this particular certification to go with all that, they'd be even more valuable employees. Maybe it's surgical or other kinds of things. So the whole movement toward increased documented competence, okay? Documented competence also means continuous training. You don't get a certificate and keep it forever. I, I have a very nice degree that I got in 1970. <laughs> Hadn't been updated much, but I still cite it all the time doesn't happen with certifications. There's a continuous update of that. And then again, the cost of college multi-year investment. Uh, we have handouts for you, but what I did was to just give you an idea. Here are the certifications that we've reported. Certifications in the credit-based program. So if you take a credit-based program, a degree, an associate degree, or these are the cer certifications that we could document. And it's less than a thousand and half of those are the nursing or teacher ed. Okay, so if you take those two out, really you're left with the healthcare infrastructure for the state licensure or certification, where there's a competency-based outcome that drives the, the ball. Nothing wrong with that, but that's a pretty modest commitment. If you go to the non-credit side, the commitment is, is even more uh, ephemeral. Um, doing great things, but th the idea that we would only have 308 certifications that we could document in a year seems to me to be less than, than what we need to be doing. We, we've sorted the data for a long time. Just to give you an idea, that the, the uh, CT is the corporate training offerings. We have 57 different certifications that we can call on that we think we could offer. The academic, we have a total of 77 that we think we could currently offer, whether we're doing it in every case, that, that's not it. Um, so a total of 124. Just looking at what we're doing, we could jump it up by 50% to 188. When we look at Region 14 in the Career Source Florida, what jobs are available out there, what need certifications, that number jumps to 312. And the total certifications, Jason, you sent me a note, and I forget what the total certifications is. It's So, so there's a total of, of documentable opportunities would be 540 certifications on the horizon. So the responses, it's not like we're sitting still. Again, the credit-based workforce under Dr. Cooper, every one of our programs is identifying at least one additional certification that we call embedded. That is, as you go through the program, you come out with the opportunity to earn that certification along the way. We're trying to get it along the way rather than at the end, but that's that's contextual. Changing the curriculum and course sequencing to make sure that students can get those certifications earlier and they understand the sequence to get them. 
We challenged every one of the advisory committees to identify the certifications that they would most want to see in their purview for us. Uh, we have created a test center on, at the corporate training so that students can test for the certifications with the ultimate ease. Uh, they can do it on, our in, on their schedule locally here, and we offset the cost of that. We put $40,000, $50,000 in the budget, I think, to help defray the cost. Some of them are pretty costly, a couple hundred bucks to take the test. We wanted to make sure that wasn't an impediment. Those are already in place in the credit programs. The non-credit, a whole new look and here's what we want to do, an inventory of existing programs. We want to be sure we understand where we're headed for certifications. We're going to uh, re renew the, the look and feel of the collaborative labs as a partner in that. They're the ones who are talking to business. Businesses come in, do their strategic plan for the next two or three months. We ought to be taking their data saying, here's where you're going to go. We can help you get there. Okay, so we cross market between those. Uh, we want to coordinate with Pinellas Technical College. I don't think that's going to be a, a problem for us. Jim Connolly is working on placement support, and, and it's built into the manufacturing and, and uh, IT grants. I think the uh, trade and logistics grant has the same thing, so we are handling our own placement in these areas. Jim is additionally revising the intake and advisement process. Want to make sure when somebody comes and they are looking for a certification, they are eligible for a certification. I hate to say in some cases, if you have a police record or others, you may not be eligible. There are some things that are disqualifiers, and we don't want you to spend any time or energy if that's not going to work out for you, okay? And then we continue to coordinate with the credit programs for discrete certifications. So Six Sigma is embedded in some of our programs, and we can bring them. Here's, here's where we're headed. Um, I want to reorganize the uh, corporate training to aggressively identify and offer a greatly expanded array of certifications. I want somebody who gets up every morning and says, what certifications are we offering? What ones should we be offering? Where's the market headed? How are we doing on this? Somebody whose only job is to do non-credit certifications. We'll rebrand the corporate training to uh, reflect the different and more responsive offerings. We're going to realign staffing. As I mentioned, Jim has already started that. We will need to hire a senior program manager to, to, who, to report directly to you. I, I need to, our, our talent, Jim and Jason know what they're speaking of. They have full-time jobs already. I need somebody who, who is focused only on this area and can drive this ball forward. I think it's, uh, it's ready. I'd hope to bring you the business plan today. It's not quite ready, and we want to bring a business plan that, that I'm going to ask you to front end some, some resources for this, give us a year's run, and then by 7116, it would be self-sufficient. But I don't wait, I don't want to do it by half along the way. I want to come back to you and say, here's a plan to get us there at the, we can start right after the first of the year, uh, and we'll bring it to the December planning retreat. Um, I, I, we, we have one thing to show. Let's switch over. We have some new tools. One of them is so, I, I think it's breathtaking. Um, we are, uh, as part of this year's budget, we, we uh, acquired a, uh, a two-phased uh, deal called Burning Glass. Burning Glass is a, you'll pardon the expression, a monster.com type operation where students, where people can get job access and everything else. We're working with them with a student interface so students can say, what does my credential get me in the job market? Can I plan for different jobs? So we're working with them as a beta site on uh, a, an analytical simulation tool for students. But I want to show you how powerful this is. Jim, uh, Jason, give us the, I, I know it's a short course, but I, it's too good to pass up. Yeah, Burning Glass uh, has a, an offering called Labor Insight. Labor Insight has 78,000 uh, robots that aggregate and pool information in for us. What we're going to do with the information is be able to tell new and, and um, emerging jobs that are available in our area so that we can then offer the certificates that would uh, match those jobs. The uh, such things such as artificial intelligence, data mining, uh, mechatronics, mobile application development. Drilling down to the granular level, we'll be able to compare the students' uh, knowledge with their skills and experiences to that of the jobs that are available. We're working with Burning Glass right now to map the SPC degrees 
and certificates so that you can go in and find out what we're offering and how you can match that to a job. And we're also working with Burning Glass to develop uh, Focus Explorer. Focus Explorer is where you would be able to take your resume and put your resume into the program and it's going to come back and render you the opportunities that are uh, locally, statewide, or nationwide. With that, Dr. Krupp is going to take two industry sectors, information technology and healthcare, and give you a demo. All right. Good morning. Mr. Chair, if you're still on the phone, I'll try to be as descriptive as possible. I understand you can't see the screen. I'm Jason Krupp, Director of Workforce Services, and I'm pleased to share this tool with you. Um, what I'm going to do is start out with the, the snapshot here, and just for... Um, We'll start out broadly and look at nationwide, and we can drill down to our local area. But if we just do a snapshot of the industry, um, it gives us several reports. So if you look nationwide, the top locations, of all the online advertisements for jobs, we see California, Texas, uh, Illinois, I'm sorry, my, Illinois, yes, New York, and then Florida uh, on the map. So this is, again, aggregating all the online job opportunities throughout the country. And the, if we look at top occupations advertised throughout the country, we'll see registered nurses at the top of the list, followed by sales, and then software developers. When we drill down to look at uh, Florida, we'll look at our region in specific, uh, the Tampa Bay area. last 90 days and we'll run the snapshot report and uh, the top locations where are the jobs advertised we see Hillsborough County with the bulk of the advertisements 29,000 jobs Pinellas with 13,005 Pasco 3,000 1,000 for Hernando the top occupations advertised registered nurses so same as the nationwide demand registered nurses in the Tampa Bay area is the top followed by the same thing we saw on the nationwide demand list was software developers specifically for applications and then sales, customer service. Uh, we could go through the list, you'll see uh, health occupations, some more computer related occupations as well. Now, to drill down to a more uh, granular level, well, let's look, before we move on, let's look at the top certifications that are in demand in these occupations being advertised. Again, registered nurse, no surprise, you need a nurse license to practice as an RN. Uh, and then there's first aid CPR. You'll start to see some of the IT positions coming up, uh, certifications, um, CISSP, there's some Cisco in here, um, security uh, related certifications, a lot of health occupational uh, licensure that you see in here as well. So now let's drill down and see a little bit more detail about the nursing occupation specifically, if we want to know um, where, the, where the, the major employers are for, for registered nurses. We add that occupation to the filter, and you can see that it starts to build the query here. Uh, and to, then we can select certifications. We already know are in license, but if we want to look at top employers, we can select who are the employers who are advertising for the RN positions. And we see HCA at the top of the list with 440 online advertisements. And this is in the last uh, 90 days. Bay Care, St. Anthony, St. Joseph, Air Force, all children's, all the major hospitals listed here. And then you get down into some of the lower numbers with the smaller uh, companies. Now, if you, this has implications for career services, if we're trying to help students find jobs and we, if there's a nurse who, say, doesn't have any experience or has less than, you know, two years experience, we can actually filter by years of experience or education in here. Uh, if we want to look at those positions that have less than two years experience, we can filter there and update the report. And it shows the online advertisements for students with less than two years of experience. Great for you know younger people with uh, coming right out of school and looking for work. Uh, we can also look at the educational um, breakdown. Uh, advertise education if they list the er the advertised. Um, actually, there's a, a quicker way to do this. 
So if we go to distribution of minimum education requirements, this will show us um, those, what are the, the requirements in the education that they're looking for. Let me take out the filter for um, experience. So we see the bulk of the positions at 1,246 requiring a bachelor's degree. This is if they included what the educational requirement is. This is not all positions, but of those that are advertised, 1,246 requiring a bachelor's, almost 700 requiring the certificate or associate's degree, and 135 with a graduate. So uh, this you know, reinforces our need for uh, expanding the, the baccalaureate uh, program offerings. So we can shift gears now and look at IT uh, related let me clear uh, this report and then we can look at IT specifically and I'll go into the occupations. Burning Glass has their own classification system which drills down to um, a more granular level than just the uh, Department of Labor. So we're going to use their classification system for this report and we'll look at, thank you, um, we'll look at the top occupations in IT. Update, I'll make sure we're Okay, let me do Tampa Bay area. Oops. Sorry. Okay, uh, burning glass. Okay, update. I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading the screen here. Let me go try the other occupation. Oh. My apologies that this was working earlier. I, I, this is a by the way, I should have given the caveat earlier, this is a two-week-old product. We've had one training session with Burning Glass. And we have another one coming up on November 5th. And we received our login access codes on Thursday. <laughs> we do have our staff trained, though. Um, the Burning Glass occupation. Um, yeah, that's the title here. Yeah, I'm sorry. My apologies. <laughs> Okay, here it is. This is it. I'm sorry. Ah. Right, my, we've seen it. Yes, my That's apologies. It's given us some difficulties. But you, you can see the certifications and demand reports are, are very powerful. And um, we can, this will revolutionize the way we deliver our workforce systems. Uh, any questions? Switch us back. I just have a couple of uh, final comments here. Clearly, we have to develop a much wider range of available products. We, we don't have enough products to sell. We're not being fully responsive to the market. All of this, I need to say out loud, the credit programs will feel threatened by the new products. That is, once we start giving people multiple pathways to employment, the old pathway is going to feel stressed by this. Okay? It's not an either or. But indeed, we've, we're seeing people getting very attractive jobs through very short training, and they are not going through the credit programs at all kinds. We'll need to increase our attentiveness and responsiveness to changing demand. So you see the tool that we have that we can instantly focus on where things are headed. We can be checking to every day to see which new stuff shows up uh, as the hiring tool, the hiring profile, okay? Uh, and then I should tell you that this kind of responsiveness is not on the state's radar. Their identification of certifications was a very narrow range that very few uh, people met. They're now trying to figure out how do we expand the range where they can support us. I think they told us they were going to give us $1,000 for every certificate. We, we had the grand total of 43. Um, then they were going to change it and have to prorate down, so we were going to get 
three or four hundred dollars per one. They're, they're, they're trying to figure out how to do all this. I suggest let's, let's let them catch up. Let's just go ahead and meet the market demand, get ourselves organized, get focused on what people need locally, hope that someday the state will send us money, a few bucks for the good work that we've done. But our, our friends and neighbors need help. So this is, this is for, we will bring it back uh, in a form that, that you can uh, take action on. Um, Want to hear your comments today. This is a major step forward for us. We're going to have to find a little bit of, if we, were, if we were a company, we would have used our retained earnings to open a new product line and to move it forward. I'm going to ask for a little bit of one-time funding to kick it off until we can get the wind in our sails and, and make it work. Um, as soon as I know what that number is, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come back to you. Happy to have your input. We've put a lot of time and energy to try to figure out where we want to be. I think we've got a good game plan here. Mr. Chairman, thank you for your attention. Thank you. The only thing I would say is the key word is competency. If we are issuing people certificates left and right and they can't do the job, um, I just went through a hiring process and had about 186 resumes come in in two weeks and I was able to very quickly boil it down to about nine because at the end of the day once you started talking to people if you actually knew what you were talking about the fact that they were certified or had a certificate in something you knew very quickly that they hadn't done much with it <laughs> so competent you, you you use the word competency throughout and that's the key word we're banking on the industry certification as the the gateway for that. I, I mean, if you're a programmer, there are industry certifications that get you a designation with certain kinds of certificates. You know, I, when we talk to those folks, they want that and two years experience in every case. We can't do the experience. So, uh, yeah, that, that, that's the only reason to do it. But we all, again, uh, you know, we all have our best story of somebody with an English degree who can't do anything. I mean, it's <laughs> not me, but I... You know. <laughs> Well, I'll make a comment just because you and I have been on this workforce advisory committee together for a reason, and that was born out of conversations across industries where um, no matter who we were in front of, workforce was an issue repeatedly. Um, and it, it still is. I mean, we just had another event last week for um, construction, the future of construction and development in Tampa Bay, and they're on stage talking about workforce, you know, and you're like, how can that industry have that issue? Um, so I will say what we repeatedly hear is that SPC is doing the best job of anybody locally, and, and I'm always very proud of that, and they say that over and over and over again. They also, we had tech data in this room say they have 150 jobs available every single day that they can't fill. And so if we can figure out the answer, I mean, I am enamored with that tool. I want access. I want to play with it. That thing is cool. Um, but the whole point of us putting that advisory committee together was to solve the issue. And if this solves the issue, that could, I mean, we could be the model nationally because we're not the only community having that issue. Right. So thank you. It's, it's exciting. Good. Good. We'll be back. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, moving on, consent agenda. agenda. Any discussion for grants, funds? Online tutoring service agreement or the Clearwater Library contractor. I'd like to have a motion to approve all of it since it is consent. Any discussion on any of those or questions? Okay, so moved. Second. Moved and second. No discussion. All in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 All opposed? So consent agenda passes. Uh, direct support organizations. Do we just move the yeah, Acceptance. Mr. Chairman, they could have been on the consent agenda, but I, I thought good government would require us to pull them out and then make a motion. <laughs> okay, there's nothing in any of those uh, audits. This is a, a fiduciary responsibility to approve, to take action and approve them. We've received all those audits uh, mm -hmm. um, prior to the meeting, so um, do I have a motion to accept the. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All, right. all opposed? Thank you. Informational reports are just in our agenda. Any unagenda items? No. Uh, down to action number 11, the proposed changes for the Board of Trustees rules You have manual. to convene a public hearing. So oh, we close sorry. the board meeting and convene the, the public hearing. There you go. Open a public hearing. Hearing none, close that <laughs> and reopen the board meeting.
the you need, a, you need a motion on the, uh, on okay? the rules changes, okay. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, yes, could I have I'm a motion on all the rules changes? So moved. Second. Second. Moved and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. Down to the President's report, sir. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, I thought I would have more specific information. Uh, the President's Council meets September 29th in Sandestin. Um, we believe that we have, uh, we, we believe the moratorium will get pulled before the start, uh, attended to the start of the new session, okay? There's some very positive discussions going on behind the scenes. Do not ask, uh, nobody is saying out loud that they've got it all worked out, but uh, I think our patient demonstration of the effectiveness and the, uh, the leadership, the, the, the incoming Senate president has invested his time and energy into seeing if we can't get a, a resolution on this. So I'm enthusiastic that, uh, that the moratorium will get lifted. Since the legislature put it on, they probably have to do it in a, in a, pub, in a, a session meeting. Maybe it'll be the organization session. They want to get it done before the session starts so that it is not hanging over the session. So I think, I think we're all gonna come out okay. And then we have one item. We have our music, uh, our um, arts and entertainment uh, bachelor's degree is stopped in place, but we continue to get support for that one. As soon as they open the, the gates, we'll be back on board with that. So uh, I, I think we'll have, we, we may even have a more detailed announcement uh, on the, the 29th. I could not get information yesterday. Uh, nobody's speaking out loud at this point. That's it. That's it. Does anyone have any other comments? Board members? Yes, With hearing none, our next board meeting is November 18th. We have to stay for the collegiate high school, so. And all we have to do is receive their audit, I think. We will uh, close this meeting. Thank you. Open the St. Peter's. And open St. Peter's collegiate meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Good, Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, trustees and Dr. Law. Thank you for the opportunity to bring forth the audit for St. Petersburg Collegiate High School. I'm very pleased to inform you that there were no findings or recommendations, so we had an excellent audit and I am respectfully requesting your approval. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions? No, ma'am, I would move approval of the audit. Do I hear a second? Second. second. Motion second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. This concludes our work this morning. <laughs>